go with uh, Grace. And she's got a, a blue sign on one side and purple on the other. She's very color coordinated. And uh, have a good time out there. Okay. Okay, we're looking forward to Colin as he comes to share God's word with us. So let's welcome Colin as he comes. Thank you. Great. So how are we all enjoying summer? Yep, two days. We might get half of a day. Anybody get any sunburn yet? This man? Yeah, I saw it on Facebook. This man looked like a lobster. That's all I can say. Was that what you, how you described it? What was? Uh, yeah, a wee bit like that. So don't we love it? It's just like the sun comes out and we feel the need just to go out and go burn me. You know, it's like have your way with us, whatever it is. It's only 15 degrees. Anyway. Uh, it's good to be here this morning, and uh, we're going to do something a little bit different if you are watching us online. Um, this morning, don't panic. The people haven't disappeared. The rapture hasn't happened. We're just going to move, and we're going to talk to a few people. Um, so here's what I want you to do. I want you to stand to your feet if you're able this morning. Why don't you do that? Can I, uh, before I make you move, just a bit of a government health warning with this, okay? If you're an introvert, don't panic, okay? If you're an extrovert, be nice, Okay? Okay, the introverts especially, okay? What I want you to do is try and find somebody who is in the same month that you were born in, okay? And find out something interesting about them. Ready? That's all it is. Again, if you came with somebody, don't panic. You can stay with them. Don't worry. Go. Go for it. See if you can find somebody. Andy needs a friend. He was born in May. Anybody born in May? Andy needs a friend. Okay, that maybe took a little bit longer than I imagined, but why don't you grab your seats? Let's do that if you can. Let's grab your seats. Okay, that was a, a little bit of a social experiment. Um, who went back to their seat? Who's sitting in the same seat? Did anybody move seat? Okay. This is your seat. Oh, flip. Don't sit in Brian's seat. Okay. Did anybody sit in a different seat? Oh, we like routine, don't we? Don't we? This is my seat. I've been sitting here since the church was founded. Um, Brian. And uh, so... Um, anyway, we'll come on to that maybe a little bit later, but good fun. Um, if you're watching, joining us online, it's great to have you with us uh, today. My name's Colin, and uh, if you're here with us, it's great to have you. If you're visiting with us, again, great to have you with us. And um, Throughout the year, we've been carrying in this theme of purpose, and so that's going to weave its way into everything that we've been uh, talking about over 
um, the last few weeks. And again, it will be um, in to today. And particularly, I'm going to pick up this theme of being fully committed. Fully committed. And we're going to learn some life lessons from Caleb. Now, but if you know me, okay, we're not, we're, we're not going to learn lessons from my son this morning about what it means to be fully committed. Although there are lessons that you can certainly learn from him. Because when he comes to church, he's fully committed to doing laps of the place. Uh, if you haven't spotted my son, um, he's hard not to. He sort of got fiery red hair and uh, runs around. That's not his mummy. That is definitely Caleb. So hopefully he's listening in the crash room. If not, why not? Why wouldn't you listen to me? Oh, maybe not. Anyway, chance to stop listening to me, maybe go and hide off for the day. So anyway, we're going to jump in. We're going to look a little bit at the life story of Caleb and find out some lessons that we can learn about what it means to be fully committed. Will we pray this morning? Will we do that? Father, we thank you for a beautiful day. Lord, we thank you that your word tells us that the heavens declare the glory of God. And so, Father, thank you that we can see you, Lord, uh, in the beauty of our creation around us. And Lord, I pray for each one of us this morning. I pray that our um, hearts would be still this morning, that they would be open, they would be soft. Lord, I pray that we would hear from you. Lord, we've already had a sense of your spirit at work in this place, already speaking to us, already prompting us. And so, Father, we just ask that your Holy Spirit can come and continue to do that. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So we're going to learn some lessons, hopefully, this morning uh, about Caleb. Caleb is a character that we find in the Old Testament of Scripture. And um, the Bible doesn't tell us actually a lot about him. So part of what we have to do is piece little bits of information uh, together. But his story really starts um, in the book of Exodus, although we don't really hear anything about him until numbers by name. But his story does start in the book of Exodus. Um, Caleb actually means dog, okay? Now, I know you're sitting there thinking, he named his son after a dog. What did he do that for? No, I, I really did research it and think this one through. But Caleb actually simply means dog, right? Dog. And some people think that it was maybe a derogatory term um, in Scripture. Other people think, no, it means loyal, like faithful. And so there's a real um, sense out there from uh, theologians and scholars about what does it really mean, this word Caleb. And so uh, I'm okay with dog because dogs are loyal people, okay? And uh, I'm okay with, with that. But that's essentially the name that Caleb was given. Um, he grew up in slavery. So the story, if you're familiar with the story of Moses, which we've talked a little bit um, about already this morning, where the people of Egypt were in captivity and slavery uh, to the Egyptians, uh, Caleb would have been born into that. In fact, he would have been two years old when Moses actually fled Egypt and went to Midian, okay, and had the encounter at the burning bush and everything else that, that goes on with that. So Caleb's life, when he grew up, was very much knowing slavery, a slavery mindset. Again, he would have grown up, his parents would have been grown into that. And again, from an early age, he would have been sent out to work. And so he would have heard a lots of different things, seen lots of different things. But again, the Bible isn't um, specific about what Caleb saw in those days, but we, we can sort of piece it together a little bit um, by what had went on. Obviously, the story uh, trans. Uh, um, goes on, and we, we know that uh, God leads the, the uh, um, people of Israel out of Egypt, and they get across the Red Sea, parts the Red Sea, all the plagues hit the land, they move on out, the people in their thousands, um, Exodus literally exit Egypt and make their way to a place that God promises. Essentially, God rescues his people out of slavery, is the big story that we get and again, it's the same story that we sit in now. It's the same story of rescue that for each one of us who has accepted Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, we have been rescued in the same way that God rescued his people out of Egypt. Then we pick up Caleb's life a little bit later on. And again, we can find this story in the book of Numbers. So can I encourage you, um, get out your Bible, dust off your Bible, however you read it, and really encourage you to delve into the story 
of Caleb. Um, one of Caleb's mates was Joshua. And again, if you know anything about me, you'll know that I called my second son Joshua. So you get a little bit of insight into, uh, into where I was at this time, reading the story of Caleb and Joshua, the two spies. Um, Joshua obviously has a better meaning than dog. So uh, that'll be interesting when they grow up. They can fight that one out. And uh, literally. So, um, but yeah, we pick up this story where um, the people of Israel um, have have come out of the promised land. They have seen God do incredible things, like incredible things. Like they cross a river and it opens up and then it closes again, swallows their entire enemy. Thousands upon thousands. This is an entire people group. Imagine Lisburn leaving, okay, and crossing the lagging, right? Like literally, and it opening up, okay, and coming to the promised land of Belfast. No, I'm going to, um, ooh, P45 coming. Anyway, um, but can you imagine that? Can you imagine um, that what's happening? The, the fact that they'd seen all of these plagues, they'd been in slavery for hundreds of years, hundreds of years. And so they probably didn't think anything was going to change. They probably thought their circumstances, this is the way of life for the children growing up, for the generations growing up. They just, this slavery was all they knew. But what they then saw was God do incredible things. The story of Caleb picks up in the book of Numbers. He's 38. He's 38. My, just my age, actually. 38. Okay, I know you're looking at me and going, no, he's not 38. Not 40, Brian. Anyway, it's so, yeah, anyway, I'll move on on the age thing. Um, but picks up the story about he's 38, and he now is a leader in the tribe of Judah. Okay? So there's 12 tribes of Israel. They're all uh, um, uh, marked. And there is one leader for this particular tribe of people called Judah. And Caleb is the leader. And he's one of these uh, uh, leaders that are chosen among 12, of which Joshua, which was one as well. So Joshua, who was son of Nun. And then we have Caleb, who was the son of Jephunna. Can you anybody say that? Anyway, Jeff, can you say that, Brian? Jephunna. Anyway, Jephunna. Um, I tried to listen to the American translator. That's it, uh, that's it, definitely. So um, the son of Jephur and, uh, was Caleb, and he essentially was one of the chosen 12 men, 12 spies, literally the James Bond, okay, um, of uh, the tribe of Judah, chosen to go and spy out the promised land, okay? This is what God had told Moses to do, to go and send them to explore. So for 40 days, Joshua and Caleb and these other 10 spies went to explore the land to see whether it was ready for the taking, okay? To try and see whether it was actually ready for them to go into. And this is what God had told them to do. But when Caleb and Joshua and these 10 tribes, 40 days they spent exploring out the land. And what they found was a, various different people groups already inhabiting the land. One of them was the Canaanites, and they were strong. The Canaanites were strong. They were a strong people. They imagine, if you can imagine the Fijians, okay? If you just take a look at Wadi, he was on the base this morning. He's probably what the Canaanites were. The, the, the other thing, there was the Amalites, and there was a number of otherites in there. You can say what you want to call them. But again, there was also giants in the land at the time, okay? And so they got back after their 40-day report, and Moses brought them before the people and said, Tell us what you saw. What did you see? What, what, was, what did the land look like? Okay? And 10 of the spies turned around and said, you don't want to go near it. We'll get absolutely slaughtered. We'll get murdered. You should see these guys. We'll never take this land. These guys are, are strong. They're fit. They'll, they'll take us apart. They'll annihilate us. Okay? Honestly, they're, they're, they'll, they'll completely do us in. If we, if we go there, we're in trouble. Okay? We're going to get our bag kicked in. Like literally, like that's where as far as it goes. There's no chance we are ever going to win this. But then it says in scripture that Caleb silenced the people. He stood up in front of all of the, the people of Israel. Okay, so nothing very much is written about him. The fact that he goes off on this, then all of a sudden he raises up and he, he silences the, the people. And he says to them, but the land is ready for the taking. The land is ready for the taking. Surely we can do this. Surely we can overcome it. So he gets up 
and he stands and he gives this rousing speech. Come on, guys, we can do it. It's probably like Lisburn rugby on a Saturday morning. Okay, you can imagine the captain going, come on, lads, we've got the feet of 10 weeks in a row, but we can win. <laughs> no, maybe not. Okay. But he delivers this rousing speech. Come on, we can do this. Surely we can do it. Honestly, ju just do it. You know, that's where the Nike symbol was literally formed. Just do it. Come on, we can do this. We can take it. God is with us. And what are the people's response? Are you mad? Instead, they, they go, let's stone him. <laughs> let's shut this guy up. Are you crazy? Joshua is totally with him. He's like, yeah, come on, Caleb, we can do this. We can do this. Surely we can go and take the land that God has promised us, that is flowing with milk, it's flowing with honey. We can do it. The other 10 spies are went, you're mad. I've seen what he's seen, and I'm telling you, you don't want to go anywhere near them. And the people start to rally around these 10 other spies. And all of a sudden, they want to choose another leader. All of a sudden, they want to get back to Egypt. Egypt seems so good right now. Why? Why? Because they were afraid of death. Fear had struck the camp. Fear had struck the Israelite people. But yet, these are the same people that had revelation after revelation of God in their life, God providing, God speaking, God acting, God doing way above and the immeasurably more. The things that we say every week, these guys seen it, yet 10 of them didn't have the faith to believe that the God who brought them this far would do it again. They, did, he, they didn't have the faith to believe for it. So instead, what they want to do is they want to silence the two people, Joshua and Caleb, in the camp who says, come on, we can do this. God is with us. So what's the difference? Andy challenged us last week about that we didn't need another revelation from God. We needed a revelation of God. So what we find here is a revelation of God, but two different actions. A revelation of God, because again, they all came out of Egypt. They all came from the same place. They all had similar experiences. They all saw the same things. They all were oppressed. They were all were beaten. Okay, they all lived in a slavery mentality, but yet they'd seen God rescue them and do incredible miracles. Like honestly, incredible things that we, we could only wish we could see today. But yet their response was so different. The old uh, children's song we used to sing was 12 men went to spy in Canaan. 10 were bad and 2 were good. You see, the, the 10 had it com were completely struck with fear. Fear had got in. Fear of the unknown. Fear of getting slaughtered. The revelation seemed to be a distant memory of what God had done. But yet Caleb stands up and says, come on. We can do this. And all they want to do is stone him. The story goes on that all of a sudden, the glory of the Lord fills the camp. Because God's, God's not impressed. Like God has done everything for these people. And yet fear has still struck the camp. These are the, they start to moan. They start to complain. They start to say, oh, it's not great being out here. I thought it was going to be better than this. Can it take me back? That sort of mentality. None of us in church would ever have that, sure we wouldn't. We would never do that. Not at all. Not in Lisburn. No chance. No way. Maybe in Belfast. No, not in Lisburn. Not in Lisburn. But essentially, what happens here is the people have the same revelation, but a completely different response. Let me ask a question. What revelation have you had of God? And what's your response? See, God reveals and we respond. Everything that we do in life, the very breath that we have is given to us. So everything that we do is a response to the revelation of who God is. His goodness, his mercy, his loving kindness, everything that we do is in response to that. So how are you responding? 
to God in life at the moment? Because it's really easy and we're quick to forget what God has already done. We're quick to forget what God has already spoken. And there's something about when God speaks, he will fulfill it. We sing it here week in, week out, okay? That his promises are a yes and amen. So if his promises are a yes and amen, why don't we walk in them? Why don't we believe them? Why don't we step into them? You see, something of Caleb he grasped was that God would fulfill his promises. Now, for some of us in here, that doesn't mean he was, you know, devoid of fear. Because fear is a strong motivator in our lives. F fear is a really strong motivator. So for some of us, people have various fears. Okay, for example, my sister has a fear of puppets. Okay, so when Easter came and I said, we're doing a puppet show, she looked at me and went, yeah, right, I'm not coming to that. Why? Because she's got puppet phobia. Now, you're looking at me, honestly, it's a real fear. Look, Google it. Honestly, it's good in Google. It has to be real, right? And so puppet phobia, honestly, she goes into cold sweats and has ran out of shopping malls when all of a sudden puppets appear. And there's specific type of puppets. Um, but anyway, so you can have a word with her if you want. I'll bring her around one day and you can have a chat with her. But puppophobia is a real fear. So she was like, no chance am I going in here. So she sat in uh, Inspired Cafe while the puppet show happened and waited until it was over and was afraid to go in until those puppets were back in the bag. Okay? <laughs> Why? Because fear has struck her. She just, I don't know what it is, but puppophobia has got hold of her. You see, these people didn't like change. They'd been rescued. But what hadn't changed was a mindset. You see, he got them out of Egypt. He got the people out of Egypt, but he hadn't got Egypt out of them. You see, for many of us, we will not fulfill our pur pur purpose in life until God can get Egypt out of us. But are you willing? Are you willing? Because he, with Caleb, what we see is a man who obviously was willing. I don't think Caleb was devoid of fear. Although scripture uh, lets us know that he was a strong warrior, he was a leader in his day. But actually, I don't believe that people are without fear. But it can either motivate us one of two ways. It can either motivate us away from things or it can motivate us towards things. Let me explain. So um, um, fear is such a strong motivator that actually it can motivate us away from situations are things that we don't ever want to be part of. It can be a strong motivator in our choice of what church we go to, okay? Are the people that we hang about with? Are the friends that we make? Are the sports that we play? I'll never play that one because one time this happened. Fear strikes us, I'll move away from that. I'll never go back to that church again because this happened. I'll never go back to church at all again because this happened. Fear strikes us and it's a motivator and it moves us away. But actually research, psychological research suggests to us that actually fear as a motivation has massive peaks which motivate us away, but also massive lows that when it happens again, we do the same thing. So we'll run again. So what's the opposite to fear? What's the opposite to fear? It's faith. The opposite to fear is faith. And fear can uh, motivate us towards faith. Well, what do you mean by that? Well, in the sense of actually the motivation towards something. You see, God was constantly motivating the people of Israel towards the promised land. But they constantly wanted a way because they didn't hold the cost of what required, which was just obedience. It was obedience that he was looking for. As much as God knew it was going to be hard, as much as it was going to be difficult, the key to unlocking Egypt out of us is obedience. But come on, we know it. How often, if you're anything like me, are you stubborn? Colin, will you do the hoovering? Yeah. Uh, yeah, no problem. Leave it with me. Eek. I'm going to have to do it. No, I'm not. What excuse am I going to make? Well, I'm going to justify it. You know the story, okay? And here's the thing. That's what we do. We justify things to get out of things. Fear can motivate us away from or can motivate us towards 
things, what Caleb had was a godly fear. Fear that he did not want to be away from God. Fear that actually, if he stayed close to God, then actually these giants, these strong Canaanites that already possessed the land, they could overcome them, but only if he stayed close to God. You see, that was the difference in the revelation that he had had. But his revelation was followed through with action. You see, we can come to church week in, week out, and have revelation after revelation and revelation. But look, if we don't put uh, shoes to it and put it into action, we're in trouble. We are in trouble. You're in trouble. Because I guarantee you, what will happen is you'll start to slip. And you've probably already noticed this in your Christian life. Because you start to slip. And all of a sudden, you'll see that you'll have those massive peaks. And you'll have those massive troughs. And that's how your Christian life looks. But actually, the challenge of the Christian life is fear that motivates us into faith. Believing that actually God is who he says he is. And he'll do what he says he'll do. And so if he promises a promised land, then he's going to fulfill it. And he's going to make that happen. There's a verse from Proverbs. Thanks. Uh, good job. Um, Fear of the Lord is the foundation of wisdom. Knowledge of the Holy One results in good judgment. That's what Caleb had. A healthy fear of the Lord that didn't, it wasn't like being scared of God. But it was being, you know, literally it was a fear not to be away from him. Fear of the Lord is the foundation of wisdom. Knowledge of the Holy One results in good judgment. Today, if you want to be wise, and if you want to have good judgment and you want to exercise it, we, you need to get the fear of the Lord in your life. Right? And we need an, a fresh understanding of what it means to walk in the fear of the Lord. If we want to be fully committed, Christ-following Christians, then this is what it's going to take. It's going to take a healthy fear of the Lord. You see, trusting isn't devoid of pain or suffering. But it does pale into insignificance when you realize who's with you. It does pale into insignificance when you realize who is with you. Your faith, according to Hebrews, is the assurance of things hoped for, the evidence of things unseen. Numbers 14, 24 says, But my servant Caleb, because he has a different spirit and has followed me fully, I will bring into the land which he had went and his descendants shall possess it. See, the glory of the Lord falls in the camp. And it says the Lord was angry. Now, for some of us, that messes a wee bit with our theology. And so you've got to, you've got to think this one through, okay? But it says God was angry. Why was he angry? Because God had done so much for these people. And still, still, they wanted to go back to the very place that he rescued them from. Really? So frustrating, right? Uh, and on uh, Tuesday night at Alpha, we were talking about forgiveness. And sometimes I wonder, how did, how, does, how did God forgive me? Why does he forgive me? Because if I was God, I would get super frustrated with me. I, I am a challenge, like, you know, I really am. <laughs> Speak to my wife. She'll tell you more. But I am a challenge. I, I don't know if I would forgive me. And maybe you're like me. Maybe you're like, I, I'm with you. I don't know why I would forgive me. But here, God takes forgiveness so seriously why because he takes sin so seriously if we try to say well I, see that sin's okay that one's not okay that's a wee white lie that's a god takes sin massively seriously he takes obedience massively seriously if you don't believe me that you you just need to look at the cross that's how much that jesus took your sin and my sin so seriously that actually he knew that it led to death, so he wanted to forgive you for it. He had a different spirit and followed me fully. A different spirit. A spirit of we can do this. Did you know there's power in words? The psalmist David um, would have said this, um, that he encouraged himself in the Lord. You know, we get into difficult situations, we get ourselves into trials and we get into tests, we get into hardships and we, sometimes we mess up when we slip up and I, and I get all that. I've been there, I've, I've got the ticket. But there is power in our words. 
psychologically we call it self-talk, okay? It doesn't mean you're crazy. But is, there is actually something about, uh, and it's the power of confession. We talked about it in our Alpha group a little bit on Tuesday night, the power of speaking out. There is something about actually when we speak out truth, when we speak out God's word, we see it when Jesus went into the wilderness um, for 40 days and was tempted. How did he respond to Satan? With words. He quoted the Bible at him. He quoted the Torah. He quoted scripture at him. Get behind me, Satan. Don't give the devil a foothold. Stand strong. Be resolute. Encourage yourself in the Lord. Some days you've got to be your chief cheerleader. When you look in the mirror, okay, uh, sometimes it's hard for me, as you can imagine. I'm looking, I'm going, really? And you're, you're going, come on, Colin, you can do this. You can do this. As, no matter what the situation is, you know, I, I shared uh, briefly, and I'm not going to say too much on this stage about this, but I shared briefly about um, on Tuesday night with some of the, the alpha group that I was in about forgiveness. And, and actually the reality sometimes of forgiveness is it's not easy. It's a struggle. It's a wrestle. But we've got to do it. I remember finding a point where I turned to Laura and I said, if I can't do this, I'm not a Christian. If I can't forgive because God has forgiven me so much, if I can't get past this, then I'm not it. But I've got to keep encouraging myself. You can do this, Colin. As hard as this might be, as painful as this might be, as much as I don't want to hear it, as much as I would love to dig my head in the sand, because we all know ignorance is truly bliss. Amen? Yeah? Right? Because when you don't know how to do something, it's better to you to say, oh, it's all honesty. I don't know how to do that. And you don't get a job. It's great, isn't it? But see, when you know a little bit, it's like all of a sudden you're given it. Okay? You knock yourself out. Go, away, go ahead and do it. But it, the thing about Caleb is he encourages not only himself, but others around us. You see, your words can either have speak death over situations and people, or they can speak life. What are you speaking? Are you speaking words that are encouraging and life-giving? Are you speaking words of death and nobody's looking? It's what we do. We're, we're chief gossipers. It's, it's what happened in the camp uh, 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 in Israel, and it still happens in Lisbon uh, today. Uh, honestly, we, 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 it, it's what we do. We pull each other down. We think that actually the best way to get one up on somebody is by blowing out their candle. Instead, Scripture tells us in Proverbs that we need to find the gold in people. Well, we need to find the gold in ourselves, love ourselves. As we've got to love others, but we've got to love ourselves. We need to keep encouraging ourselves in the Lord. And that's what Caleb did. That's what Caleb did. He was 40 at this time. And the Lord comes, enters the camp. And what we find in the story is he's angry. Moses then intercedes on behalf of the people. Instead of all the people getting struck down and God had enough for them, God accepts an agreement with them that they will that he will let them live, but none of them, bar Joshua and Caleb, will enter the promised land. So for 40 years, you know the story, they wandered in the wilderness. They wandered and they wandered and they wandered. Why? Because they just didn't get it. They just didn't get it. Maybe this is a moment this morning where actually the Lord just wants to help you get it. Get it that the wandering ceased this morning. Wandering ceased. There's a reason when God says, trust me, and I will make your path straight. What does he mean? Because he doesn't want you to go wandering in a wilderness for 40 years. God has, has so much more invested in you, so much purpose invested in you, that that is not what he has for you. There was once a, a flock of wild ducks. Uh, they were flying in formation, heading south for the winter. And they formed a beautiful flying V. And it wasn't the Mighty Ducks, okay. And they were admired by everyone who saw them below. Now, one of the ducks, Wally, okay. Uh, one day, Wally, one of the wild ducks in the formation, spotted something on the ground that caught his eye. It was a barnyard with a flock of tame ducks who lived on the farm. They were waddling along the ground, quacking and eating corn that was thrown on the ground for them every day. And Wally liked what he saw. 
It sure would be nice to have some of that corn, he thought to himself. And all of this flying around is very tiring. I like to just waddle for a while. So after thinking it over for a while, Wally decided it would be a wise decision to leave the flying V formation and head for the barnyard full of corn. He landed amongst the tame ducks and began to waddle around, quacking merrily. He started eating the corn while the formation of the ducks continued their journey south. But Wally didn't care. He thought, sure, I'll rejoin them when they come back from the winter in a few months. It'll be fine. So several months went past, and sure enough, uh, Wally looks up, and there's the flying V formation uh, um, returns. And he decides, well, do you know what? I'm a wee bit tired of this barnyard now. The corn's not as good as it used to be. And uh, do you know what? I thought I liked the look of those ducks, but I'm not so sure about them now. So maybe it's time to maybe it's time to go. I'll go back to the flying ducks because it, it got a little bit muddy anyway. It was difficult. So Wally thought, time to leave. So he flapped his wings furiously, trying to get airborne, but he had gained some weight from all of the eating his corn. And do you know what? He hadn't exercised his wings, but finally he got off the ground. Finally, he got off the ground, but he was flying too low and he slammed into the side of the barn. He fell to the ground and he thought, oh, well, I'll just wait until next year. Sure, they'll be coming back here and I'll rejoin them then and become a wild duck again. But when the flock flew overhead once more, Wally again tried to lift himself out of the barnyard, but he simply didn't have the strength. Every winter and spring, he saw his wild ducks um, flying overhead and they would call out to him, but his attempts to leave were all in vain. Eventually, Wally no longer paid attention to the wild ducks flying overhead. In fact, he had hardly noticed them. After all, he had now become a barnyard duck. It's true that sometimes we get tired of being wild ducks. We get tired of being Christians. We get tired of being followers of God. Sometimes it isn't easy being faithful for the long haul, seeing the best in people. The people are doing, at the time, the best that they have with the resources that they have available. Sometimes it's hard to see the gold in people. Sometimes it's hard to stay motivated. But it's in those moments, it's in those moments where Satan comes and tempts us. He tempts us out of formation. He doesn't make us. We put boots to it, remember? He doesn't tempt. He just tempts us to fall out of formation. He tempts us to go other ways. He tempts us with things of the world. He tempts us with our past. He brings up our past and says, you'll never make it into the future. That promised land, those promises that God spoke over you, that purpose that you're really trying to push for and decide, where is it for me? You're not going to make that, really? You? But look what happened to Wally. You see, he thought he had the strength and the belief just to check it out for a while. And he thought he could leave it when he wanted. Sure, it would all be okay. He justified it. He thought, oh, sure, it'll be fine. It'll be all right. I'm a Christian. I'm strong enough. I can do this. See, sin is like that. Sin is like a trap. It's a way of challenging us into people that we don't want to become. Eventually, we lose touch with who we really are. And that is, as we sang this morning, we're children of God. We're sons and daughters of the Most High. And like Caleb, we need to remain faithful, not to forget who we are, who God is, and what he's going, calling us to do. This morning, are you fully committed? Are you fully committed to being a follower of Jesus Christ, no matter the cost? Have you counted it? Are you flying out of formation? Have you even made that decision? Have you made that commitment to follow Jesus with all of your heart? Hey, I'm not going to sell you a false Jesus this morning because that's not what I'm here to do. But what I am here to do is tell you a Jesus that no matter your battle, he surrounds you. 
no matter what he's called you to do, he'll give you the grace to do it and the resources to do it. No matter what you're facing right now, you can and you will get through it. But you'll only get through it together. And that is why, that is why, not for the sake of having numbers on seats, but that is why when scripture tells us that we need to not be in the habit of giving up meeting together. You see, when you're in trouble, church is the first place you need to be, not the last. It's the first place. But how often do we get embarrassed or afraid to ask for help? We do the stiff upper lip, okay, because that's what we think we're meant to do. But this is the first place that God has for us. Why? Because he has a promised land for you and he's a promised land for us that we are only going to inherit together. We are here to help you inherit the promises and the purposes that God has in your life. That's our job as leaders in this house. And you are only going to fulfill them when you remain in formation. Because there's lots of temptation. It's out there. You're going to face it on a daily basis. But we need to help each other stand together, encourage one another and say, surely we can do this. You see, we need to be faithful in a faithless generation. That's what Caleb was. And these people have seen God do amazing things. But we need to be a faithful people. I'm going to ask the band to come back up. And as we round this off this morning, Maybe this morning that question is for you. Are you fully committed? God has made that commitment to you. You see it on the cross. You see it in the person of Jesus Christ. He died for you. That eternity starts now. Life to the full can start now. When you make that decision to follow him. To be fully committed. those who have made that decision to follow Jesus this morning we maybe need to learn something from Caleb one person called this the Caleb principle and it says this if we give ourselves wholeheartedly to God he gives us the confidence to accomplish the impossible you see the the promised land seemed impossible to the people of Israel the promised land seemed like it was never going to happen. It was more a pipe dream than a reality. But here's the thing, at 85, Caleb takes hold of the promise 45 years later that God had made to him that he would inherit the land. You see, you will fulfill your purpose. You will fulfill your purpose. God has got too much invested in you for you not to. (coughs) But you can forfeit it. Bad attitude, excuses. So what's going to mark you out? What's going to mark us out as a community of God's people? that we can step up and stand out to be fully committed followers of Jesus. Let's stand together. Let's pray. Father, would you help us see with eyes of faith, see what we don't see in ourselves, see what we don't see in others, but see how you like you see them. Lord, that surely we can do it that we can fulfill the promises on our life, the purpose in our life, the God-given calling. And Lord, I pray for, for us all as we collectively explore the promised land for what's ahead for us, individually and collectively. 
Lord, that we would have a Caleb spirit. One that says, we've seen you do it before. We want to see you do it again. And we can surely do this. You can surely do this. So Father, encourage us this morning. Strengthen us. In Jesus' name.